Okay, so the last chapter of semester, consumption, savings, and investment. This is one of them that we kind of skipped like, earlier on, but okay. So, remember way back, we had the thing where I asked, your household income, where does it go? There's three places. Where were those three places? Consumption. Consumption was the third one. Taxes. Right. Taxes is the first one. Savings is the second one. Taxes, savings, and consumption. Those are the three places that our household income goes. Well, there's nothing that we can do about the taxes to help Sam and Aunt G, they get theirs first, right? So what we're getting to is what we can do with the money that we do have, and what do we do with most of it? Consumption, right? That is actually the purchases that we make, the spending that we do. But the vocabulary word here is disposable income. This is the, our income after taxes. That part of our, after our same name, did you get there? This is the money that we have to make our choices on. And what do we do with that? Consumption savings. Because after taxes, what's it? Oh, come on, Lord, this is working. Oh. Out. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I'm going to try not to sing that song. Anyway, well, let's see. Oh, you, 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 what? What? Yeah. A little new age thing. There. Put it back and get back out. It's not working either. Okay, so after taxes, tax and savings consumption. So the part that we can make sure it's on is the consumption savings, because that is our disposable income. The part of our income that we can dispose of however we see fit. We can save it all, we can consume it all by buying stuff, we can consume it all in flames if you're crazy and you take all the money and you just set it on fire. Yeah, that's what we can do with it. Um, I'll just tell you right now, I think one of the extra credit questions was that household income where the three places they go to. So if you were to graph what our consumption looks like compared to our disposable income, it's going to be pretty darn close to a 45 degree line. Because when I so demand it, my marker isn't working. Dry on here. Okay, so because we spend most all of our paycheck, right? Yeah. Am I right? If you got a hundred dollars, what are you going to do? You're going to spend um, maybe you can be nice and you can save two percent of it. You can spend just about all of it. If you make two hundred dollars, well, you're going to spend one hundred ninety-five. We spend just about all of our money. So, consequently, if we spend about all of our money, what do we save? Well, none of our money. Almost none of our money. When, if your income is the 100 bucks, you save it two of them, right? Because you spent the other 98, remember I left. If your income was 200, for that example, five bucks, right? But what ends up happening is the saving amount that we save and the amount that we spend adds up to the total amount. And I think now, because I'm using the word spend because it's consumed, you can like that. You can take your money, set it on fire, that still is consuming it. You can take your money and lose it out of your pockets into the seat cushions of your car or your couch. Well, that's savings, right? So, what can you do with your money besides consume it or save it? Nothing. Lending it. Haley could, she's got money instead of spending her savings, she could lend it. Well, lending is a form of savings. We talked about that the other day. Because what do you do when you put money in a savings account? You put money in with the expectation of getting more money in return. And that's what Haley's doing with money that she's lending to me. She's giving up money in order to get more money in the future. It still is savings. Investing in stock markets is savings. Sorry, y'all. Thank you. 
Investing in stock market is saving because we call it investing because you're buying part of a business. Yeah, you're buying part of a business, but you're not buying tools and equipment or anything. Your business is making more of a busy in order instead of somebody else being in order. And all you're doing is you're getting a piece of paper with the expectation of exchanging that paper for more money in the future, just like a CD or anything like that. So, next, we have the average propensity to consume. Propensity means what? It's like tendency. And I probably misspelled that. What do you tend to do? On average, what do you tend to do? So what we're talking about here is of your paycheck, how much of your paycheck, generally, do you spend? And it's, instead of talking about it as dollars, we ultimately are going to convert it into a decimal, which is a percent that's waiting to happen. A percentage is a decimal waiting to happen. A fraction is a decimal waiting to happen. So, in that example I had here, give me the name of the human being. Tom. Frank. Somebody else. Frank. Frank, he makes $100 a week. Frank spends $98 a week. So, what is his average propensity to consume? 0.98, which means he spends 98% of his paycheck on an average week. And we talk about it on average, because some weeks he's spending it all, some weeks he might, he might actually save five dollars because he has an extra five, but on average, throughout the year, how much of his income did he spend? So, average propensity to consume is how much of your current paycheck are you spending? For some of us, that number is not point nine eight. that number is what? Right? Because we're going 100 over 100, right? Uh, hopefully that's not all of you. You got the math there? Thanks, so. The math here, it isn't hard. You got it kind of ready to go. Uh, for those of you that are following along with slides, I'm, well, then I'm skipping. I, I, just, I keep meaning to rearrange these slides and I never do. So, the average propensity to save is okay. How much of our current paycheck do I save? How much of Frank's paycheck does he save every week, on average? Well, if he spends 98, how much is he saving? Two. So he puts away two dollars each week. He is saving two percent of his income. That's what that's what Frank is doing on average. Frank is saying. Generally speaking, when it does sales, what should happen is you take your ATC, your APS, you add them together, and they end up being one. Because that one is 100%. That is all of your paycheck. What percent of your paycheck are you spending? What percent of your paycheck are you spending? There's nothing left, right? So your numbers should add up to one or 100%. If, leave it this a thousand, on the test. I actually give multiple choice, so it's already left as a decimal on the test. But if you were to be converting these things to percentages, well, be sure you convert them all to a percentage. You don't mess things up. But this is all 100% of your disposable income. Give me the name of another new one. Jack. Huh? Jack. Jack. Okay. Jack. Let's see. His disposable income is. 300. Jack's savings is, um, I'll just go 15. Practice right for How much is his consumption? What is his APC? What is his NPC? I mean, excuse me. Okay. 
as Jack. Y'all need any more okay. And the numbers are going to be pretty much this easy. Uh, because if you end up with a number of 0.3892517, it did something wrong. That's just what you That's the way it's going to be when y'all take you guys to go to next semester. For those you need to do. So if he's saving 15 out of his $300 for what's happening, he's spending 285 of it. Right. Okay. So here's where you, so you got to do a division problem. You can either do two division problems or you can do a division problem and a subtraction problem. Right. Which is easier? To divide 15 into the 300 or divide 285 into 300? The 15 is probably the easier one to work with. So 15 divided by 300 is 5%. So he's saving 5% of his money. If he's saving 5%, how much is he spending? 95%. We got that? Oh, of course not. Um, you'll get it because the second set that we do the math is the same as the first set. Uh, if you have questions, we'll come back to you. Actually, here's another example. Come on. <laughs> oh, you That was weird. Yeah, that thing just yeah, disappeared this is weird. on me. I've already on. Okay. Let's try. Give me the name of another game of bank. Sam. Okay. Sam, say my name. Sam, his disposable income, his paycheck, is $200 a week. Let's see. Consumption, savings, ABC. You'll see why I type everything. All right. Let's see. Consumption. Oh no. <laughs> Consumption, 220. So, what is his savings going to be? Negative zero. Negative oh. 20. He's borrowing in some circles. If you look, borrowing is also called dis saving. He is either taking $20 out of his savings account each week to do the extra spending. Or he's borrowing money to do the extra spending. Either way, he is dis saving. So what would his APC be? APC is what percentage of his income is he spending? So 220 divided by 200 in this case is going to be he's spending 110% of his income. So he is so that's going to be 1.1, right? Yeah. 1.1. So he is, his APS is negative 0.1. He is borrowing one tenth of his income in order to do his extra spend. The, the APC and APS have to add up to one. Can it happen? Yes. It happened on a national level. Back in the 1990s, the national savings rate in the United States was a negative number. For a couple of years, there were just the way things went. For a couple of years, we were spending, as a nation, we're spending over 100% of our income. It was like around 101. We're not doing that now. We kind of we got slapped around by a couple of recessions, especially the 2008 recession. That's where we slowed things down. We're, our savings rate might be around 5% now, or and probably maybe going down, but. It's better than it has been a lot of times. It's only zero or one or two percent. Um, so, APC, average propensity to consume. It's what percentage of our income are we spend. Um, and APS is the average propensity to save. What percentage are we save? And this is a disposable income. This is our paycheck after tax. Um, it's our part of our income that we can dispose of after Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia are done their thing. Y'all can handle the math? Yeah. That's the only math we test. Um, nope. Because we have this math. 
The other thing I skipped. You have marginal. What's marginal mean? Extra. Extra. So this is our propensity, our tendency. We got an extra over here. This is, if you get extra money, what are you going to do with that extra money? You get a pay raise. What percentage of that pay raise are you going to spend? You get a Christmas bonus. That's extra money. What are you going to do with that? And the savings percentage and the spending percentage is going to be different. Because the more money we make, the less we need to be borrowing money to buy our stuff. And maybe we get to the point that we can be like Haley and we have extra money that we don't need to spend that we can start saving or lending or that kind of thing, right? And generally, some of you are going to be like, wow, I just won $5,000 in the lottery. Some of you will be, I just won $5,000 in the lottery, woohoo, and you can blow off $5,000. Some of you could be like, dude, this is like free money. I just won the lottery, and well, let me put some of it aside for my next tuition payment, my car payment, something like that. Some of you could be responsible and say, you could be like, it's extra money. I'm used to spending the amount of money that I have been spending. This is extra money, so this is an opportunity for me to save. I'll be coming back to this. So your NPC is how when your Income changes. You get that pay raise. How much does your consumption change? The first person was Frank. Frank. Oh, um, and it's be the same old Oh, well, it can't be the same. I mean, that's just who you are. If you spend all your money now and then you get extra money and you spend all of that, what do you do? You couldn't just sit there and have yourself, you, if you're kind of a nerd or accountant, you can't say, well, I'm going to spend, save 5% of my money no matter what it is. Every week when I get my paycheck and any other money that comes in, I'm automatically going to save 5% of it. You can be that way. Good on you. Uh, but let's see, Frank, uh, to do this change, for you math majors, let's do my So. Frank was making two hundred. He was making two hundred dollars a week. He gets a, you know, he, no, Frank was making hundred dollars. Frank was making hundred dollars a week. Now he's making hundred and twenty dollars a week. So what happened to his income? It went up by twenty dollars. So that's why you do the new minus old. So what ended up happening? He used to spend. $98, now he is spending $115. So what ended up happening? His spending went up $17. He gets an extra 20 and he's spending 17 of it. So 17 out of 20 is 0.85 if I'm doing the numbers off the top of my head correctly. So he's saving 2%, 5%, He's spending 85% of that pay raise, what's he, what's left? Oh, okay. 15%, yeah, which is what we're going to be doing here next slide. So, in this case, you gave him, he, he was spending 98% of his money, you give him extra money, well, he's only going to spend 85% of it. Good on you, Bob, or Frank, or whoever you are. Good for you. Um, I'd like to, we're going to tend to, as humans, do this. And the higher our incomes tend to get, the lower that amount is going to get. What, do, what about somebody like, I don't know, Bill Gates to go from making $10 million a week to $11 million a week? He's not going to increase his spending by 10%, right? He probably ain't going to spend it because he ain't spending all the $10 million a week he's making already, right? So you give him extra money, he's probably going to spend absolutely nothing. Of that extra money. So his APMPC might end up being zero. Good for you, Bill. So that 85% is that from the $20 that he got or from the whole world? Yeah, it's 85% of the extra money. Oh. So his new, if you want to go there, I don't go there, but if you want to go there, what is happening? 
He's now making 120, he's spending 115 of it. So what's 115 out of 120? That's going to be like 95%, 96%. So he went from spending 98% of his money. He doesn't spend as big a chunk of his pay raise. So now his new MPS, I mean, new APC is now like went from 98 down to 96 or whatever that math is, but I don't answer that. You're with me. So you give him an extra $85. I mean, you give him an extra $20. He spent 85% of it. So his marginal propensity to consume of that extra money, what percentage of it does he save? So his income was 100 and it went up to 120, right? So his income went up by 20 bucks. Uh, his savings was $2 and now his savings is $7. Uh, $7, yeah, so it went up by five. No, that's not right. Because this is supposed to be 15. So maybe this was five. So then, oh, whatever that number is. Okay. Because I can't remember what my example was. But what happens there is this is if he was spending 85% of his income, of his pay raise, he is going to be saving 15%. But because that's all the pay raise, that money either is going to get extra money, is either going to get spent or it's going to get saved. There's nothing left. So your marginal propensity to consume and your marginal propensity to save is add them up to the equal one as well. Because something's gotta happen with all 100 percent of that pay raise. You either spend it all, save it all, or spend some, save the rest, but there's nothing else. Are with me? So the spending added to the saving should equal one. Yeah, should equal one, because that's one hundred percent of the income that we're talking about. In this case, 100% of the extra income for ABC and MPC of ABC and ABS to 100% of our curve. Um, as your income goes up, your ability to save will increase and you will actually will save a higher percentage of it because you don't need as much. When y'all are y'all, Y'all don't need as much. Y'all don't have that much money. Y'all gotta spend every penny of it because y'all still gotta buy groceries. Y'all still gotta make car payments. As your income goes up, you pay. You, you've got enough money to pay all your needs and maybe and buy some of your wants. And then you get to the point where you got enough money to pay your needs, pay your wants, and within reason, you have extra to go ahead and save. So generally, the NPS is as our incomes go up, that NPS. Um, and that's why, generally speaking, the MPC is lower over time and it's lower than our average for best in the consumer. We started out at 98% and now we're going to drop down to only spending 96% because we're getting to save more because we've got more money, so we're better able to save. Um, what happens if you're in a fixed income? If you're in a fixed income, well, your MPC and MPS, we don't know because you're not getting an increase. So you just back to wherever your APC and APS was to begin with. How much of your current income are you spending? And that stays the same. Ooh, actually, that's probably gonna go down. I mean, on fixed income, your income stays exactly the same month to month, year to year. But what happens? Prices go up year after year. If prices are going up and your paycheck is going up, well, you've got to spend more money in order to buy the same amount of stuff. And you, so you either have to stop buying as much stuff or what's going to end up happening? Your APC is going to continue to go up. Your APS is going to continue to go down until you get to the point of you're selling the house, you're cashing in your retirement, you're selling off your cars, 
and you party your jewelry in the jewelry shop because you don't care about your kids inheriting your grandma's wedding ring because you need them, right? So this can end up being a negative number because you, you know, this happens to an interesting amount of our elderly because their income ain't equal to the amount of money that they have to spend. And so that ABC goes beyond one and that APS ends up being a growing negative number. That's a lot of social security. Social security, well, that's part of the income. And so that's why, hopefully, generally, the social security, all they're making is a social security check. That's all they're bringing in each month. A social security check goes up with the cost of living adjustment each year, equal to the inflation rate. So hopefully, the APC would stay the same. But the APC is going to change for various things. Maybe grandma spends the same amount of money this year as she did next year. But maybe next year she has a heart attack and she has three more medications she has to buy, right? So she's got to spend an even larger chunk of her paycheck because her needs have increased. Go with me on the map. Pretty easy. So I, I will try to email out a couple of problems just so you can practice. I will try. That's all I can promise you that I will try. So, what determines how much of our paycheck are we going to save versus how much of our paycheck are we going to spend? The number one thing is our income. How much is our paycheck? If you only make $100 a week, you're spending it all, right? If you make it $1,000 a week, well, maybe you got a little bit of wiggle room you can start setting some aside. If you make it $10,000 a week, well, you hopefully you got more wiggle room, hopefully you're setting a larger percentage aside, right? The number two, well, if you're making that much money, you still need to save that you have to save to get a million dollars when you save the Yeah, the nice thing is you can easily afford it, and what we're getting, and you need a larger target. I mean, instead of being satisfied with all, all having a million dollars when I retire, a million dollars to live off of for the last 30 years of your life really sucks compared to the lifestyle that you had in making $10,000 a week. Right, so you would have to be saving more to be maintaining that level of lifestyle after you retire, but you're making more money, so you're better able to do that. Instead of making more money, you can. Yeah, and then the other thing is, the more money you make, the more you can save, so you can retire earlier. Right, that should be y'all's goal to retire by your time y'all are thirty. Make That's it happen. Moving to New York. Good luck with that. <laughs> Good luck with that. Okay, so income. If the bigger your paycheck is, the more to really think about what's gonna be triggering your decision to say. Really think about it that way. If your income is going to be the number one. The more greater your income, the greater the possibility that you have to save. You're more able to save, you're more willing to save. The number two is wealth. <clears throat> if you already have money, even if you don't have a job, you win $272 million in the lottery and you say, I like it all now. And then after taxes, that kind of stuff, you end up with $125 million. Are you going to keep working? Crap, no. But you got money? Yeah, what are you going to do with some of that money? Are you going to take all that money, stick it in the mason jar somewhere, and let it sit? Which is a part of our savings, I guess. But no, uh, you could be at least one in the bank and letting it earn some interest in that kind of stuff. But you're going to keep, that's going to adjust your spending and savings, right? If you only have, you know, if you win $5 on the lottery and you try to retire, well, you're going to be buying a whole lot, right? And you can spend every bit, bit of that $5, right? So. Money coming in and money you already have are going to be dictating how much you can be saving, how much you can be consuming. Third is expectations, but I'm a little bit specific here. So one time I get specific with my expectations. Your expectations for your future income. Preston, you are pretty sure that next week, they're going to be calling you up with that job offer that you've been waiting on to where you're going to be getting that job making $350,000 a year. 
So in a couple of weeks' time, he's going to start making, knocking down three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. So that's what well, that's twenty thousand dollars a month, something like that. Yeah. Is that going to change his spending today? No. Maybe. If I'm thinking, if I'm pretty sure, and the more sure that he is that he's going to get the job, the more likely he's going to say, "Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll spend and start spending a little bit of it now." Well, I mean, yeah, but it's like, why live miserable for a week, another week, when I know I got this big payday coming next week? Why should I be miserable this week? And so Preston's going to go out and he's going to take his credit card, he's going to buy a couple things, that kind of stuff. He's going to rack up a little couple thousand dollars for the credit card debt. He don't care because he's about ready to get thirty thousand dollars next month for his first month paycheck, right? Or Preston, you think, or realistically, you think next week they're about to fire you. Is that going to change how much you save now? Is that going to change how much you spend now? Yeah. yeah. So your future expectations of your income is going to be driving how much you can save, how much you can spend. If he thinks he's going to lose his job next week, well, he's going to spend more, I mean, save more and spend less now because he's been saving for the rainy day because he doesn't know how long he's going to be at work. There is, dude, uh, ooh, ooh. that's ringing the bell. There's something that I remembered five minutes ago and I forgot. I have a couple of years. It's kind of related to future income. The other expectation here is how long you think you're going to live. If you think you're going to die tomorrow, are you going to take your money and put it in the savings account today? Nope. No. If you think that that big, huge, giant, Asteroids about to strike the Earth, and we're going to be like dinosaurs, and we're going to be geoing gone. Next, I'm taking my money out of the bank, and I'm throwing the biggest party that I can think of. Right? I don't have any money in the bank, so it's going to be a pretty small party. Yes, but that's that's what we're going to do. If the older that people get, the need for them to be saving for the future goes away. The need for them to be spending for now increases, especially when their medical costs increase. But it's like I'm 99 years old. What the Am I saving for? Right? I'm going to live a less comfortable life because I want my kids who, well, I'm 99, my kids are going to be like in their 70s. So, really, do I need to be sacrificing for my kids, 70 year old kids? Maybe. No, I don't think so. Um, so, okay, for grandkids, well, okay, the great grandkids, well, great grandkids, if you do the math, they're only about 8% of my DNA, so I don't know if we're really related. Right? <laughs> When you get and the older you get, the need to save goes down. The drive to save goes down. And then sometimes, especially with the health expenses, though, the need to consume may end up increasing. You know, they have the, um, cash for life for the lottery. Somebody here, it depends. Sometimes you can get a thousand dollars, you can get a thousand dollars a day for life. They used to, I mean, you don't need to save. Do you? Yeah. You do. The score the sooner you save, the sooner you can retire. I mean, you can get a thousand dollars a day for life. Yes, a thousand dollars a day for life. A thousand dollars a day today, it's pretty good income. You're young. You're about 20. Yeah. We'll go over that. Okay. You don't have a thousand dollars A thousand dollars a day, okay, not bad. But, so that's what, $30,000 a month, that's not bad. They're making the kind of money there. Okay. But a thousand dollars a day today, it's not bad. But what's that thousand dollars going to be able to buy you eight years from now? When you knock it on the door being one hundred, but that's okay. Because think of all the healthcare technologies that will be coming into play over the next eight years. Guess what? You're probably going to make it to one hundred, especially since you're making enough money to pay your health, your hospital bills, that kind of stuff, right? So you are going to be insured. So you are going to be getting good healthcare. You're going to have a good chance to make it to one hundred. A thousand dollars eight years from now might have the same spending power of three hundred dollars now, two hundred dollars now. Is that the kind of life that you're gonna be wanting to live then? Yeah, but I mean you're getting more I mean you can get seven thousand dollars. Yeah, seven thousand dollars a week when you're one hundred would be the equivalent of somebody giving you $200 a week now. So your lifestyle would have to be decelerating. You have to be cutting back your lifestyle every year going forward. 
Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. yeah. So what do you got to do? Start slow or start saving. Hey, just be hey, pay, pay, uh, pay attention when it comes to retirement. We're talking about okay, at least our security gives you that inflation increase. That thousand dollars a week lottery winnings doesn't. But there were some people working in the town of New York, where they got absolutely screwed because nobody knew any better. Well, some of them did. Back in like the 50s and 60s, these uh, furniture plants were opening up the tech world. Actually, uh, carpet, they were making rugs and that kind of stuff here. And then so the company said, okay, retirement plan, we're going to give y'all $300. You work for us, 365, we'll give you $300 a month afterwards. Which that sounded good for the people, you know, back then they were only, you know, Talking in the 1950s, where someone was like a nickel or a dime a bottle or something like that. So that'd be like somebody promising to pay you two thousand dollars a month, but not bad. Now, but the problem is, is there was no inflation adjustment. So when you're 20, and somebody says I'm going to give you. When they were 20, and somebody says I'm going to give you 350. When you graduate, when you retire, they're like that sounds good. But by the time they got to 65 and started getting their retirement checks, their retirement checks were at 350 dollars a month, and that 350 dollars a month didn't go very far at all because there was no adjustment for inflation. So. Basically, a lot of people, they worked 30 years, 40 years for the company, whatever, they retired, and what did they end up with? Basically, minimum wage. And the company. If that. But the company said, hey, we filled our end of the bargain. We told you when we hired you, $350 a month, and that's what we gave you. That's what we're doing. Cash is cool. Yeah. The, company, the, the workers kind of got shafted there. But just so pay attention to the paperwork when you're, I mean, Nobody, unless you're dealing with some kind of like small business, whatever you're working with, you know, some farmer out here in the middle of nowhere kind of thing, thing. If you're working for any kind of legitimate company, something like that, you're, there, you're not going to have that. But look at the fine print. Look at what they're promising you and make sure that you're going to be taken care of. Well, that's a question. So, hitting, uh, let's say you said 150 million, it's better than getting a head off. Okay. Because you said, had that much money. <coughs> well, that's the thing. A thousand dollars a day. What's this? Three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. So right now you'd be making lawyer money. But twenty years from now, that would be more like middle manager by her management level money. Forty years from now, that would be like middle manager money. But so if you win 150,000, 150 million, whatever lottery, well, but you, you need to do that. Was 360, 365,000 a year times 80 years? What's that add up to be compared to the 150 million? Yeah. I think the 150 million is going to be better. Oh, I know the 150 million is going to be better. Like 365 times 80. Well, that's still. 150 million divided by 80 years, that's $2 million a year. So, yeah, you want that 150 million annually. Just good to use over the But, okay. It was me. Lottery winnings. If you win a million dollars in the lottery, you don't win a million dollars. You win 20,000 a year for the, I mean, 50,000 a year for the next 20 years. And so, if you say, I want it now, we, I think we talked about this. If you say, I want it now, they're going to say, well, what we would have done is set aside 600000 with your name on it. It would be an earn, would have been earning interest, and we would have been paying you $50,000 a year over time. And so, we'll give you that 600000 we would have put it in the bank with your name on it. But then you got to pay taxes on this, so you'll end up with 400000 Or you can get $50,000 a year the next few years. But sort of the thinking there is, okay, so to get 50,000 a year for 20 years, so in a way, is that really life changing money? 50,000 a year and then they take out taxes or whatever, that's kind of like, okay, your paycheck. Hopefully, it's gonna be less than the paycheck that you're gonna be getting on the job that you're gonna be getting when you graduate. So, but you can't quit work on that because you're going to be kind of, you're going to be living an okay lifestyle, nothing exciting for the next 20 years, 
but then you've got 20 years with no work experience, and then when the lottery check stops coming in, then what do you do? You gotta go find a job, right? So you can only win one or two million in the lottery. Instead of getting this little dribble in, if somebody wrote you a check for $600,000 right now, would that change your life a little bit? Yeah, that's an opportunity for you to go ahead and buy a car, buy a house, or something like that, as opposed to the little dribble over the next 20 years. So if you only win one, two, five million, I'd say take the lump sum because that little dribble is really not going to have a real profound impact on your life. But, pay off your tuition. Yes, pay off your tuition. But if you win $372 million in the lottery to where your annual payments from the lottery commission each year, whatever that is, what did I say, 372 yeah. So they'd be paying you like, dude, I'm trying to do plan, like $17 million a year. Can you live off of $17 million a year? Oh, yeah. Easily. So what do you do? Maybe you just tell the state, you make me the payments over the next 20 years. So you take the risk. The state takes the risk. Because if you, you say, okay, 372 million, well, you, okay, you give me the 115 and I invested in the stock market, and then the stock market tanks, and you took that risk, and you got hosed, right? So let the state take the risk because is the state of Virginia going to go bankrupt? No. no. So let them take the risk. And there you're getting what what is it, seventeen million dollars a year, whatever that number ends up being. So that seventeen million dollars a year, well guess what? Okay, save, take a couple million of it and set it put it in invest it in the stock market or that kind of stuff. So you will slowly be building up a pretty honking nice stock portfolio on the side, but meanwhile you've got the Virginia taking a risk on a lot of it, and you still are living off of whatever fifteen million dollars a year, which is still a pretty so that's kind of my strategy, if not that I win, not that I, not that I play, but if I was to win a lottery, that's kind of the strategy I would do. Let the state take the risk. For the, in a short haul, because 15, 17 million, that still is a life changing amount. Right? Do they adjust it by the inflation? Nope. Uh, they just do that discount rate thing from the beginning, and it's, it is what it is. You won $172 million, well, we're going to take, metaphorically speaking, we're going to take $200 million, stick it in a bank drawer somewhere with your name on it, and let that draw interest off whatever that they're investing in, and they got their payments. Pay. And your payment is just a flat same, same number on payment number one as it is on payment number 20. So that's kind of the way I would look at it. If you make a little bit, you know, impact your life a little bit. If you're going to make a lot, let them take the risk. Um, which was that thing that I remembered that I forgot that I remembered that I forgot that I almost just remembered it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the third thing is going to help the fourth thing that's going to determine how much we of our paycheck we're going to be spending versus saving is consumer indebtedness. How much debt do you owe? If you're already in debt of your knees, you got a bunch of credit card bills, that kind of stuff, well, you're going to have a negative savings rate, right? Uh, and you're and you're going to be paying interest payments, which can actually have a negative impact on how much you consume because you're paying interest on stuff you already bought in the past instead of taking that money and buying more right now. But if you don't have any debt, you've got a credit card with a pretty good credit limit. Well, then it is an opportunity for you to spend more. It, uh, so you, those of you that aren't in debt up your eyeballs, you will be able to go one day to the bank and borrow money to buy a house. But if you already owe three house payments, nobody's going to lend you money to buy the fourth one. Right? So how much debt you have is going to be impacted this. What is that expected real interest rate? After adjusting for inflation, how much pain are you going to be having to pay when you're borrowing money and when you're saving money? Tax changes, our taxes can end up impacting your income. That's going to change that disposable income number right there on the top. They give a tax cut or they do a tax increase, that's going to change how much of your paycheck you can keep and spend. And then demographics, young people, which I kind of talk about young people, y'all need money now. Because 
Y'all, young, you don't have a house, you'll need one. You don't have a car, or you got an old piece of junk to hang you down car for your parents. You're gonna need a car somewhere along the line. Y'all gonna have kids. Y'all are gonna have all these expenses coming up that old people don't have. Hopefully old people get a point, the house is paid off, the car is paid off, we feed the kids anymore, it's just us. And hopefully we're in reasonable enough health that woohoo, we ain't got a whole bunch of doctors, bills, and medicine and that kind of stuff, but we can even afford to go on a good vacation in Florida every year for right? So young people are spending a greater percentage of their income. Old people, then as the health declines as they get older, they're gonna get back to spending a greater percentage of their income. But people in the middle, 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds should be spending a lower percentage, saving a larger percentage because that's when your income is the highest. Right now, y'all making seven and a quarter, eight, nine dollars an hour. When y'all are bit graduate from here, you've got a job, you've been working there for 10 years or whatever, you've got 10 years worth of experience, you middle management or something, you're going to be making like $25 an hour. By the time you get to 55, hopefully you'll be making like $35, $40 an hour, something like that. Right? And then you can retire, you can be making $0 an hour. Right? But your income is going to be going up over time. And meanwhile, okay, you're done buying diapers, the kids are gone, and what do you got? If you're helping them with their college tuition, well, good on you, but you're not that. Right? Um, but your expenses are going to change. You can hopefully, if you buy the house when you're 25, you've got to start paid off when you're 55. And then you're making your biggest earnings. The last 10 years of your working career between you 55 and 65 and the house is paid off, score, right? So depending on your age and that guy's have been in different social groups, ethnic groups, and otherwise have different philosophies about spending versus savings, that kind of thing. And that's going to impact the way overall in the country, how our savings is going to be, how our spending is going to be. Do they charge you taxes for the money you get from the state of Every year. Yes. Yes. Your water things. So, what was not on that list was prices. Prices do not determine how much of your paycheck you're going to spend. Prices do determine what you're going to spend that money on. Right now, it don't matter where the price of gas is, the price of milk is, the price of Cheetos is. Dollar, I'll spend it 100% of your paycheck, right? Gas got cheaper, you're still spending 100% of your paycheck. Cheetos gets more expensive, you're still spending 100% of your paycheck. Prices, just like prices were not in the determinants of demand and prices weren't in the determinants of supply, remember from chapter three, prices aren't in the determinants for consumption and savings. They're just determining what we're gonna spend the money on. When gas gets more expensive, I'm spending more money in the gas pump, so I'm going to spend less money going out to eat. When gas gets cheaper, I'm going to take more money and I'll have more, I'll put less in the gas pump, so I've got more money to turn around and spend going out to eat, or actually you know, buying name brand food instead of grocery store version of it, right? That's what ends up happening there. Price expectations will, expectations come back yet again. Price expectations will change how much we consume. If you think that TV is going to be on sale next week, you ain't going to spend the money this week. You're going to save it this week in order to spend it next week. All right? Price expectations will adjust our consumption savings, but the prices themselves do not. You're in a grocery store and you, you pick up a gallon of milk, like, great day, it's gone up to $4 a gallon. Well, you push that cart down a thing, and then you pick up the cheap version of baloney, not the good name brand version of baloney. You walk in the grocery store planning on spending $100 on groceries, and that's what you're going to do. How many of you? Maybe y'all do. You, you go to the grocery store, you do the grocery shopping, you're actually keeping an account in your mind, but I do you. I just <laughs> I'm going to work there. It's my job to know how much I pay for pizza. And so you're actually adding it up and you're like, okay, I got $55, I got $65, I got $85. You do that. Yeah. Yeah, but some of us just do some of us don't. But, but why do we do that? Because you want to know, okay, I done bought the laundry detergent, I done bought the bread, I done bought the whatever. So how much money do I have left to spend when I'm on the Right? You choose the question. Right? 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 Right?
I want to know how many packs of Oreos and M&Ms I can buy. Well, in order to do that, I need to know how much I got to know how much rest is. Right? I have that card. Here. I'm gonna, the cheaper that I can get the toilet paper, the more M&Ms I can buy. What? M&Ms are fantastic. Do you not like M&Ms? Oh, no, I love M&Ms. Oh, okay. I'm just saying like cheap toilet paper. She tore the paper, yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. It's easy to steal for not. <laughs> <laughs> not from the store, but when y'all are in the college dorm or whatever, it's going to be very easy to find rolls of toilet paper and liberate them, I'm just saying. Moving right along. So, investment. <laughs> I can't believe I'm inspiring y'all to start a <laughs> crime, but okay. Investment as buying tools and equipment in order to increase our production. Right? Investments, buying tools and equipment, machines and land. So we can make more, we can build more, we can serve more customers, we've got more tables and chairs, we can deliver more pizzas because we got more trucks, we can shoot more squirrels because we got more rifles. Oh, I saw somebody hit a bear. What? Just this side of South Boston, I saw it this morning. Oh I mean, God. there's like three cars, trucks, whatever, they are, and it just happened. Like, he wanted to hit it. Uh, I don't think so because uh, I think the front end of this vehicle was kind of. Where was it now? A bear? Anyway, yeah. yeah, so anyway. Okay, I digress, obviously. So, investment, buying tools and equipment for us to increase production. What would make a business want to buy more tools and equipment? What would make the college want to buy more desks, buy more computers, that kind of stuff? It ultimately comes up down to the What's the extra cost to buy it? And what's the extra benefit for having it? Which we talked about in the labor chapter. If I'm hiring the extra worker, how much am I gonna have to pay? And how much extra work am I gonna get? How many extra t-shirts, how many extra balloons, how many extra whatever is gonna get produced because I hired them? What's the extra benefit to the college to buy another desk and put it in the classroom? They can add another student. They can, but guess what? We already have some empty clip desks in here. So what's it really going to benefit the college? No, that's not me. Nothing. <laughs> it's not going to benefit this college anything to add an extra desk into this classroom. We just point to the marginal benefit is zero. So what does it cost them to buy an extra desk? It's probably, it's probably going to be depressingly high numbers of these desks. Would they make that decision? Right? So, yeah, okay, we can, let's go ahead and buy another desk. No. Nobody's looking to buy another desk and stick it in this classroom. So the extra cost and extra benefit of the investment, you look at each investment one at a time and compare it to determine is it worth it to do it. And some of those, what goes into that thinking, the things that determine that extra cost, the things that determine that extra benefit. First, how much profit are you going to make? What is the expected profit? If we're going to spend money to put another cell phone tower in town, how many extra calls are we going to be able to route? How many extra people are going to say, hey, I got to make a cell phone service. Let me make more calls. How much extra money are we going to make off of it? Right? If you don't expect to make a profit, like a college does expect to make a profit off of putting another desk in here, then you're going to do it. Right? How much extra profit are you going to get? What's the interest rate you're going to have to pay on the money that you're borrowing? In order to do it, or conversely, instead of spending money buying a cell phone tower or a desk, maybe your money would be better served going into the bank and earning 2% interest. Technology, what technology is out there available that can enable you to be doing more, faster, better, increase our, increase our productivity for our workers, that kind of stuff. Cost of capital. What is the cost for the desk? Is it going up? Is it going down? What is the cost for the cell phone tower? Is it going up? Is it going down? Then add to that, there's an extra cost that's kind of related to the real interest rate. Sometimes we talk about capital as being money. If you've got to borrow money, what are all the, you know you got to pay interest rate. But there may be other expenses involved with borrowing the money, like other, an application fee, an appraisal fee, a processing fee, and all this kind of junk. When you buy your first house, it's going to come with like your loan is going to be hundred thousand dollars loan is going to come with about five thousand dollars for fees. Be prepared. So a hundred thousand dollar house, it's going to be one hundred five thousand not a loan. 
that you're going to end up paying 200000 on. That car, when you buy a car, remember that title, tax, tags, all that kind of thing? $130. Okay. Yes. It's $30. You, should, you can experience that. You, you just experience that. Capacity utilization rate. We talked about excess capacity earlier this semester, and I was just looking at that today when I was making the test. I'm like, I really use the same words in other places. But we have extra desks. We don't need to buy any more. We're not using our ovens enough. We don't need to buy any more. The cell phone tower is only doing 10% of the workload that it can handle. We don't need to put up a second one. All right. But if you're already overloaded, maybe you buy it, buy a second oven or cell phone tower or whatever. What are the costs involved in purchasing the item, maintaining the item, and operating the item? You buy the oven. That's over here. You buy the oven. But then you got to pay whatever delivery fees, surcharges, that kind of stuff for, some, for buying the thing, ordering the thing, having them deliver it, set it up, plug it in, the electrician to do the extra wiring to get the other jacks in there and to put the extra breakers in your breaker box and get the inspector. That costs money. And then, protection costs. Then you, operating costs, that oven's using extra electricity, right? So how much electricity is that oven going to be using every day for the next however many years that that thing's going to be going on? And then maintenance costs, how often are you going to have to take that oven and rotate the tires and change the oil and all that kind of stuff on the oven? Yes, okay, yeah, correct. But what are the maintenance costs that are going to be involved in it? What about that? Maintenance online. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's not separate. True. This is about buying the equipment, but then yeah, you're going to have the higher version to be worked in. Um, then, okay, I'm going to buy this oven, I'm going to use it to bake more cakes, and I'm going to turn around and sell it, I'm going to end up making more profit, and then I'm going to have to give a chunk of it on the same now, Jimmy. The bigger that chunk is, the less interested you are in investing, right? Why am I going to buy an oven if most of the money I'm going to make is going up the same thing as genius? And then, here again, expectations. If I think I'm going to die next week, if I think the business could go bankrupt next week, I think we're going to go into a recession next week. Am I going to be buying a new oven or cell phone tower or something like that? Yeah. Uh, I think all of the students around here are eating some of that romaine lettuce that's got the E. coli on it. I think every one of y'all is going to be dead next week. Do I need to get more desks in this classroom? No. How's that for order? There you go. Apparently now it does. There's some beef that's got, I don't know if you don't know what it is, but it's brown beef that came out of Arizona. Oh, yeah. Arizona, I think. So, they got a cola. They, they, they came from the water, is what happened. Okay. So um, check the recall. If you've got some beef in the house and you don't know what the story is on it, go online, look for the recall and go make sure it's one of those. Oh, what did that happen? Uh, like two days ago. Oh, wow. I don't it. The romaine lettuce was last week. This is this week. Maybe the romaine lettuce was two weeks ago. Can you learn why it happened? Romaine. What? You don't know why all the E. coli and the romaine happened and everything? Because well, no, it's it's the water. It's because um, when Trump did his budget or whatever, he cut environmentalists because they used to go and check all the water they use for every water and crops or whatever. And Trump's like, that costs so much. He cut it, and then so now that water was used to water cattle and water different plants and crops, and it had E. coli in it. So now cows have E. coli, romaine has E. coli, and probably a lot more that we don't know about. Okay. Uh, Mr. Truth is in the middle of a cynical. That's me. <laughs> uh, maybe. But before the EPA got their funding cut like during the Obama administration, it went the water supply, it's like Michigan, went sideways. Yeah. Right along. yeah. So, uh, anyway. Stop cutting the truth is in the middle. It's just voodoo and just wait to see the results for NASA's landing on that as <laughs> So, uh, the real interest rate, we talked about this before, this is the interest rate after you take out for inflation. Haley was lending me $100. I was going to pay her $105 back for price, so she's getting 5% extra for me. But unfortunately for her, prices went up 3% along that time. 
So she's really only clearing 2% after inflation. She lent me enough money to buy 100 cans of soda drop, and I gave her $105, but that only ended up being enough money to buy 102 cans of sun drop, not 105, because the price of sun drops went up. Right? Don't have any. Yay. Okay. Now, um, I've got two different directions that I want to go if I can get this stupid thing scrolled. Yes, I hate Microsoft. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to random stuff maybe if we have time. But instead, I want to do this. And those of y'all who have been paying attention also, but I, I want to put, I'll, I'll be tie some stuff together. Put a bow on my thing. So the question is, is what did we learn this semester? Every decision has that to and every decision has costs. Marginal benefits, marginal costs, opportunity costs, all that kind of stuff. Marginal benefits is what are you gaining by taking action? What are the extra benefits by buying a cell phone tower, buying an oven, dating that person? Think about the non-financial as well. What are the extra stresses involved by getting that cell phone tower, getting that extra oven, getting, dating that extra person? And then there's also the consideration, is anybody besides you gaining, are you doing it? Is anybody getting, anybody's life besides your own getting better because you came to college? Yeah. Yes, several people, including me. Because I, uh, I, I'm i honored to get to know y'all and I enjoy working with y'all and teaching all this. Y'all have been one of the better birds than I have had here. I so. was going to say if you went to wish you came soon. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I went there and I went past that. <laughs> but when it comes to the extra costs, you got to think about what are all the costs. What are all those benefits? Not just you, but to your parents, to your family, to your friends, and whatever. But then what are all those costs? All the time you get, not only the money you're spending to come here, but the time you're away from your friends, the time you're not watching shows on TV, the month that you had to cancel your Netflix account because you just didn't have the money because of whatever, because you were here at school and you didn't work as much. Some other things are not financial. But overall, if you consider all those costs and all those benefits, if the benefits outweigh the costs, do it. If you're thinking, should I ask her out or not, the worst you can do is say no, ask her. Because what's the benefit? If you're going to go into business, you're going to start making something for things you need land, labor, capital, knowledge, extra credit, not just. Wait, wait. Peace is good for business, business is good for peace. Supply is our willingness and ability to do something at something. So Willingly, willingness and ability to produce, make stuff at different prices. Our willingness and ability to work at different wages. Our willingness and ability to lend money at different interest rates. The higher the wages, the higher the interest rates, the higher the prices, the more we're willing to produce, work, or lend. Demand is our ability and willingness to consume at different prices. Our willingness to and ability to hire different wages. Our willingness and ability to borrow at different interest rates. Determinants, those things that determine our demand, those things determine our willingness and ability. It's how we think about the product, how we feel about the product. That, that was that income, case of preferences, price of substitute, price complements, I got it. But the price of the product only determines how many we buy. Not necessarily what we buy. If I'm not interested in Brussels sprouts or I'm allergic to Brussels sprouts, I don't care what the price is. If I'm interested in sun drop, I care about sun drop. When I go into the store, I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to look and I'm going to see how much sun drop is. I'm going to be looking in my wallet to see how much I can walk out with. Equilibrium is the balance between supply and demand of prices. If prices are too high, we're not going to make as we're not going to buy as much, so the prices are going to go down, and they're going to reduce their production. Our four participants in the economy: you and me, the businesses we own, the government that we are proud members of, because we're we the people, and foreigners. Does everybody in the United States everything we do in the United States, and then all the not United States people? Sure. 
for us, us and businesses, we give them our time, our labor, and our resources. They give us stuff and resources like bread. I should put pay wages there. I can't put it on that one. Uh, cash is expensive to process. Now we just put tax. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I've done pretty better with our stuff. Um, yeah. Us in the government. We give them labor and resources, just like we do with businesses. We they give us services and resource payments like rent, wages, and that kind of stuff. Too. Cash is exchanged in process. Same basic relationship. Our money, taxes, savings, consumption. Like I say, I'm pretty sure this is the next credit question on the desk next week. Tax savings. Yeah. See you learning over this, right? The GDP overall, our economy overall, is all the spending the households do, the spending the business is doing on investment, the spending the government is doing, and it is spending as far as doing our economy in terms of net exports. So, we're coming along to stuff that's actually coming up on, or oh, we haven't quite gotten to this test yet. Increasing minimum wages. You should jack up minimum wages. That's going to increase a lot of people's wages, which is good for the workers. But not so good for the companies. Increasing minimum wages can cause inflation. It might end up helping those teenagers more than the low skilled workers that it was intended to help. And overall, it's going to cause some people to lose their jobs, but it might cause other people to gain jobs depending on the industries. So remember, we had you know, the dude that was spending his money making house payments and that kind of stuff. He's buying less than a teenager that kept a job is buying more Cheetos and video games, so there's jobs being created. Those industries. Efficiency wage is paying people more than you should. Nice idea, but it last. Who are not unemployed? People, it, you got to be in the labor force in order to qualify to be unemployed or employed. Who is not in labor force? Kids are not. Retired. Retired people are not. Stay at home moms are not. Disgruntled people, disabled people, institutionalized people. They are not in the labor force, they're not working, so for pay, what's that definition? Over 16, working for pay, or actively looking. These people are failing on one of those three. Uh, I shouldn't use the word fail as a negative connotation, but they're just not doing all of it. Types of unemployment, yeah, that frictional life happens, teenagers getting fired or quitting or that kind of stuff every day. Yeah, structural. Or in the world, when I say the world changes, but your skills didn't, so you get left behind. Seasonal unemployment, some of you might experience this in about six weeks. Sorry. Uh, cyclical unemployment, these are little speed bumps in the economy, like oh, 2008, 2010. The GDP measure it is all is is busted because there's people doing work and not getting paid for it, like those say on moms. There are people that are making making money selling stuff that has already been counted in the past. There are financial transactions where, you know, somebody's giving somebody else money to do the spending for them, and then, you know, you criminals, you know who you are, president. Not calling anybody's name president. Real and nominal. We've seen this several times this semester. Your real income is your nominal income after inflation. Real GDP is nominal GDP after inflation. Real interest rate is a nominal interest rate after inflation. It, it, a lot of the stuff, there's parallels here. That's why I'm coming back together. Nominal is what it is on name. Your nominal interest rate, that's the sticker that's hanging on the sign on the door of the bank when you go in there. But when you end up paying, it's going to be a little bit different. GDP, that's the number that they report on the news. Income, that's the number that's on the front of your paycheck. Population, as it grows, we get more workers, we get more customers, and our economy at least needs to grow fast enough to create jobs for those new workers and create the products for those new customers. Or else things are going to get disjointed. Higher unemployment, higher inflation. So if we get help business, everybody wins. But that was slow. The government intervention may end up being needed to speed things up. That government intervention is no such thing as free lunch. It can often bring higher inflation and higher interest rates. It's that crowding out that we talked about a few weeks ago that is going to be on this test next Thursday. 
debts. Or the crowding out higher interest rates and higher prices. So if the government wants to speed things up, they're either going to spend spend more themselves, they're going to lower taxes so we can spend more, they're going to lower interest rates so we can borrow money to spend more, or they're going to increase the money supply, create more money. Bloody market. What are we as America going to not only make enough for ourselves, but we're going to make enough that we can sell to other people throughout the world? Those things we have a comparative advantage in. Those things that we can make with smaller sacrifice. Those crops we don't have to give up as many trees of bananas in order to grow coconuts. Right? So, but when we trade, if we're buying more than we're selling, this is the stuff we talked about just two days ago, if we're buying more than we're selling, we're slowly going to be losing market share to foreign companies. We're going to end up with slower job growth as a result. But we do get more variety, we do get lower prices, and overall money leaves the country. So when they print more money, how does that work? Because they can't just like give it out, like. Well, they don't exactly. I mean, it, it's not really the printing money, but it's indirectly. It's like printing money and using it to buy stuff, like buying back the bonds that they sold earlier. So they're just printing money and sending it themselves. Yes. Okay. And, and the spending themselves because they've been spending themselves by paying back loans that yeah. they already made by buying these bonds back. And stuff like that. Getting yeah. It's not just that the, the, the bank said, okay, we've got a five ripped up hundred dollars bill split exchange with the Federal Reserve because it's five new ones, so they're nice and crispy and that kind of stuff. And then the Federal Reserve sent six. No, it don't it, 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 it doesn't have it. Well, I think Jake, why didn't they just print money? They sold their debt. Because then it would lose out. Because national debt changes every day. And then by printing more money, it's going to be impacting the interest rate that they're going to be paying on that national debt that they already have. And the other one. If we are an exporting country, then we're going to be gaining market share, we're going to be gaining jobs and getting faster job growth, but our people in our own country are going to end up paying higher prices, but money comes into the country, and hopefully they'll be okay with higher prices because they, they got jobs. Uh, the strong dollar, one dollar can get you a lot of money in a foreign country, and that makes foreign products cheaper. So we end up getting more imports, we do less exporting. Prices end up getting lower because we're bringing in more cheaper stuff. Comparatively, jobs get lost here, but it's not bad when you go on vacation. The weak dollar gives you the opposite effect. Less imports, more exports, and jobs gain. And my board. Uh, oh, well, the reason why I gave up is because that was the last slide. So, how about that? Uh, okay. So, go with me on that. Okay, so the test is next Thursday, Thursday at 11 o'clock. Don't freak out. I have at least one person that's going to be coming in here with y'all and they're going to be taking a different test. But don't worry. Just finish this. Y'all see this other girl in there. You're like, who are you? Just, it's okay. Um, she's going to be taking a marketing test, so don't panic. But it's just a test over those chapters that we talked about. Once the test is over, stick around for a couple minutes, I'll grade it, or don't stick around, get out. I'll have your grades posted in Blackboard within an hour of last first training in your test. The uh, grades will be in Blackboard, and grades will be in SIS because. So if I don't do it then, then I'll forget about it. So what about you today? You did a lot of reviews. Tuesday, there is no classes Tuesday. Today is the last day of classes. Here, well, well, no, Friday, technically, tomorrow is the last day of classes. But yeah, you don't see me until next Thursday. What time, Thursday? 11 o'clock, Thursday morning. Yeah. So, this is it. Uh, I will attempt to get you a couple of homework practice problems, send them out and say, okay, you know, hopefully, we're going to do that soon. I'll get back to my office. I promise that that works. I'm just going to have to stop how much you say, how much you. Yeah, then you can't say you can't see it. You can't see it. But then I'm going to try to make, create two or three problems just so y'all have a practice. We can make sure we don't know. But as you saw, it ain't rocket science, and the math is going to be very simple and straightforward. I'm not going to be using the curveball. You will not be calculated. It's, you won't. Um, but anyway, it's a good say before. I mean, I really have enjoyed having y'all in the class. It's going to be so much better. And 
I had a good group last year, but then I had like a pretty year drive around. But anyway, y'all y'all been good. I've enjoyed the feedback, enjoyed the discussion, conversation, I guess. So and for most of you, I would be honored to have you in the class in the future. Or some of you named Connor and Preston. I don't know. But but um, overall, I mean I, I thank y'all for your time. And drink some drop. And be safe this weekend with the weather. It's not gonna impact us 